If you've been following our house building series, and I recommend that you do, you may have just gotten through watching a crew of nice and effective young carpenters put a whole bunch of hardy board siding on this house. I mean a whole bunch. But in the, in the process of making those videos and giving you the information that's included in those videos, there are several pro tips that we just couldn't fit in as the story was unfolding. And that's what we wanna give you right now, just in case you're thinking about putting up some of this stuff yourself. Yeah. I did on purpose, really. So really, I'm only talking about fiber cement siding in this video. And the first two or three things I want to talk about are about cutting this stuff. First, throw away your skill saw, because the dust will kill you. Second, get a set of nibblers and cut from the back side. Now this piece was cut from the front and it pulls up a little kind of a fuzzy edge on the face that's presenting. So if the cut is not too tricky to reverse in your mind and lay out on the back, cut it from the back. You're gonna have a nicer job. Regarding these nibblers or shears, I like mine and it could be that this is a universal characteristic, I don't know, but I can loosen up these Allen screws right here with the wrench that is provided on the cord, and then rotate the cutting head. What that does is it gives me the latitude of, instead of having the machine come along and the drill, the cord on the drill hang up on the work, so I can't really move the shears, the blade around to find the sweet spot, I can turn the head, get some more clearance, and cut with the cord up out of harm's way. Now you can see it took me a few jobs to figure that out because it will wear the cord out dragging on the work, but that's a nice feature. The other thing that is true on as far as I know every one of these things is that the shear itself, the blade itself will get dull and can be replaced. And some of them I think are reversible. So check that out when you're getting ready to buy one. So a set of shears, the nibblers will cut almost anything you need to cut. But there are times with interior angles and intersecting shortcuts, you know, things like this, where you need to be able to make a shorter, finer, more, more abruptly ended cut. So angle grinder works great. Put a diamond blade in there. Watch out for the dust. Protect yourself. And a buzz saw, a fine saw works really good too for getting those inside corners. Now you can take your wood chisel and, you know, knock out the corners, or you can take a utility knife and worry it out. But it's nice to have the right tool for the right job, and so set yourself up, and you're gonna make a lot better progress. How to know when they wear out? And you see these big old bevels here? Yeah. Those used to be on this side. See how oh, they're really? starting to make bevels there? Oh, wow. You can take these blades and sh And spin them. And spin them. So once they get there, it just kind of stops yeah. cutting. It's probably. almost like the lower jaw never wears out. It gets a little bevel here. Yeah, it does. It does wear out, but... You gotta change the... And you buy, like, every, new... Every yeah. Blades. Like I said, it's $93. Yeah, you might as well buy a new tool. Dude. Yeah, that's crazy. But I've had that tool for 15 years. Let me point out a couple of processes that are really just standard carpentry processes, but a big part of what you do when you're putting up fiber cement siding. When I say standard processes, I really mean carpentry 101, and that is three different kinds of cuts. When people are speaking of a cut as a carpenter, usually they're talking about cutting across the width of the board, a cross cut. It's probably 80% of what we did putting the siding up on this house. A couple of things about cross cuts. Make it square. If it needs to be square, make it square. When you're cutting fiber cement, it's going to caulk in place until you have some forgiveness but it's excellent practice for when you're putting up wood siding where you have no forgiveness, and darn it, it needs to be perfectly square. Next thing, even if you can make your cut perfectly square, when two ends butt up to each other out in the middle of a run, like this one, use factory ends because they are perfectly square and they're primed. They're not cut, they're not disrupted, they lay together nice. So use factory ends in the middle of a run and use your field cut ends up against trim, corners, 
whatever other projection you run into on the side of the house. And then caulk it in place. Fiber cement requires that the cuts either be primed, painted, or caulked in place. The next really common kind of cut in almost any kind of carpentry is a rip. A rip is a cut that is parallel to the long axis of the board, like that. A rip is also a noun. This is a rip. This is the piece that comes off after you have ripped a board. This is an example of the starter strip that we ripped off of the edge of a piece of uh, siding, installed it behind the first course of siding with the factory edge down to provide the kick out in the bottom course that you've got to have so that from the side, the appearance of the siding is uniform from the top to the bottom. A nice little kick out, which helps the water drip free of the foundation. Now, a lot of the time, a carpenter will mark a rip with a chalk line, right? I mean, you can snap a nice straight line as long as you want. It's just not that handy on fiber cement siding because you can't really drive a nail to hold the end of your chalk line if the rip happens inside the length of the piece somewhere. So most of the time, you will be scribing the layout for your rip. Scribing a mark means establishing some way to keep the end of your pencil the same distance from the edge all the way down. Now you can also use a speed square. Put the end of your pencil at the measurement you want and slide the speed square. You can also use, if you're a tri-square kind of a guy, the tri-square to set whatever measurement you want. Burn it on the, let it rub, burn. Let it rub on the edge of the siding and slide it down. So however you lay out your rip mark, make it straight, keep track of where you're at as you run your shears down the length of the board. If it's going to be exposed to the weather at all, it needs to be sealed, primed, painted, or caulked, and uh, cut it from the back. So Kenny was the cut man on the crew, and he had a speed square that had a series of indentations on eighth inch centers that he could lock his pencil in and make an accurate scribe. I mean, pretty straight, pretty nice all day long. And you know, if I was gonna do this every day, all day, I probably would find one of those too. The third cut that you're gonna run into a lot on siding is a rake cut. And it's a hybrid between a butt cut and a rip is a rake. And we've talked about those in our roof stacking videos in our series. But for that cut, which is gonna be very repetitive, you can use a framing square, you can put a square fence on here, or you can use stair gauge sets, or you can buy an expensive rake gauge, or you can just cut a template. You can take one of your pieces of siding with a real nice true cut that works really good and just use it to repeat that angle over and over. Or, like we did on this job, made a little template out of plywood on the two major rake cuts that I'm going to be encountering all the time on one project and then have something in plywood, quarter inch, something light that you don't mind if you drop, you don't care if you lose, and in the meantime you can rely on it for a nice straight line. So in terms of accuracy, you know that everything here is caulked and painted and that the, the manufacturer requires a gap at each end to receive the caulking. We've talked about that. But that's no reason not to use sixteenth of an inch targets, right? I mean, if you're shooting small, you're going to miss small. So leave, you know, a nickel, an eighth of an inch on each end, but call out your measurements in dimensions that at least give you a chance of actually being accurate. This next thing is a general principle to construction you've heard me talk about before, but it's really sort of emphasized on hardy board. And that is, you have to stage your material and your workstation appropriately for several reasons. First, this stuff is heavy. You don't want to carry it a long ways. Second, it's brittle. And so it has to be a short, smooth movement from where it's cut to where it's put in place. Third, it's expensive and it's easy to waste a lot. And in general, you're either going to be going up and down a ladder or have your workstation up where you're at or have a cut man on the ground handing it to you. So spend some time thinking about where to cut it, how to support it, and how you're going to get it to where you're going to actually nail it in place. In terms of how you support this stuff when you're cutting it, you can't cut it over your knee. You can't cut it between two sawhorses. It has to be uniformly supported its entire length or you're going to be throwing that piece away when it breaks off halfway through your cut. In terms of your cut station, it might look like Kenny is cutting this between two sawhorses, but he's not. He's got a 2x12 on there creating an actual workbench. You don't want to have to give any thought to whether or not this thing is going to gradually bend and sink and break just as you're finishing the cut. It's got to be 
thoroughly supported from end to end. When it comes to fastening this stuff to the wall, don't even try it if you don't have a nail gun. I mean, nobody wants to pre-drill the holes and the, the fiber cement just blows up if you try to hand nail it, so you've got to have a nail gun. You watched my crew use their coil nailers. They're great. You can control the depth of the, of the set. It holds more. You don't have to reload as often. But I have no problem using my framing nailer to put in a hot dipped ring shank eight penny nail because I can adjust the set depth. And that, my friends, is critical. If you, whatever kind of nail gun you're using, if you overset the nail into this stuff, you're gonna be breaking it at that edge, and sooner or later, it's gonna fall off the wall. If you underset the nail, it's gonna be holding the overlapping course proud outside from the wall. It's critically important that you adjust the pressure on whatever gun you're using to where it sets flush. Doesn't countersink, but just kisses up, holds it back, and you don't have any more projecting than the thickness of the head of the nail. Now, I mentioned this in the installation videos, but it's got to be hit again. And that is, you try to hit the studs. You lay the studs out ahead of time, you try to hit them, and the manufacturer allows that if you hit the studs two-thirds of the time, if one-third of your fasteners are just through the subsheeting and two-thirds of your fasteners are into the framing members, you're fine. And you are with a ring shank nail. So the last item is just as indispensable as a nail gun. Don't try this without it. And that is these gecko siding gauges. Now these are something that I had heard of, I had had described to me, but I couldn't really visualize and certainly didn't appreciate until these guys showed up and started using them on this job. And so I ran right down and got a set, but I didn't pay close enough attention because as it turns out, they come in a 7 16 inch set depth for LP and a 5 16 inch set depth for fiber cement. And I grabbed the wrong one off the shelf, but you're gonna get the right one off the shelf this will enable one guy to do the job of two men and it will pay for itself in the first three hours of the first day. So get a set, be darn glad you've got them, and pay attention when you do this job because if you don't start right, you can't finish right. You can build in mistakes that will obviate the warranty and cause early failure, but if you do it right, I think cement board siding in the Pacific Northwest is one really good way to go for the cladding on the exterior of your house. Thanks for watching this video. And before I sign off, the last thing I want you to think about is, if you're putting siding on, you're getting up off the ground. There are several ways to do it, and I've got good videos on most of those ways. Check them out. Stay safe. Thanks for watching, and keep up the good work.